Yes, it's Iron Dome again. Is the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome. The Iron Dome bat. Iron Dome missile. The Iron Dome. Iron Dome. The Iron Dome. The Iron Dome. Obviously, this isn't the first video about the Iron Dome. There has been another one before this. And in the previous video, I was making some hypotheses about the Iron Dome guidance and engagement policy. The interceptor is the Tamir missile. It is a smallish missile, 3 meters long, 16 centimeters diameter. The weight is declared to be 90 kilos, which is on the light side for a missile of this size, but not entirely unfeasible. Most sources say that the missile guidance is electro-optic which means infrared basically, but this is not the usual tip of an electro-optic system. Some of the viewers pointed me to other sources and stimulated a discussion. But first, what is Iron Dome for those who haven't seen the previous video? Well, it is a CRAM and v short system designed to protect an area, uh, usually an urbanized town or a military installation, mainly from ballistic threats. These include artillery, rockets, mortar and artillery rounds, uh, but also improvised rockets as well. The system has been developed by the Israeli Rafael in cooperation with the American Raytheon. It is mobile, it uses an AISA radar for surveillance and target designation, and also a lightweight interceptor missile launched while well, almost vertically. It is currently deployed since 2011 in the south of the country against the Gaza Strip and in the north against the groups active in Lebanon and Syria. It has become very popular following the recent events in Israel and Gaza. Last week I did an entire video dedicated to it, if you are interested. And in this previous video, at some point, I say this. I believe that some deliberate disinformation has been spread in the media by the manufacturer and the IDF. Actually, A, no disinformation, just some confusion. B, my intuition was right. I have been pointed to Rafael marketing material by a viewer, and this material states that the Tamir interceptor features rather guidance, as I had hypothesized. The missile also features a data link, and it works, well, like every weapon of this category. The data link guides the missile up to the point where the radar autonomously acquires the target and guides the missile to the impact. Actually, the Seeker should be a simplified version of the Derby air-to-air -air missile. I have no direct source confirming that, but it seems reasonable. The designers had this type of saturation attacks in mind, and beyond trying to build a cheap missile and having 20 Tamir ready to launch for each launcher, they tried to build a software capable of defending the area in an intelligent manner, maximizing the utility of the launch missile. We already mentioned the capability to ignore the threats that are not going to hit anything of value, but then you see this. And this. As you can see, the missile can fly pretty complex trajectories and in some cases also seems to be reaching the falling target from the back. And these trajectories, well, don't seem to be particularly efficient, even more so against a non-maneuvering target. So I think that's my speculation that what we are seeing here is a reallocation of missiles on the fly. The presence of the data link in a kinematically very capable airframe makes the missile reallocation hypothesis even more likely. In fact, the complex trajectories that we see flown by the missile seem to suggest that interceptors are reallocated on the fly. The second missile in a couple of weapons launched against the same target. Uh, if the first is successful, it is diverted against another target. Or missiles that are launched against a target that veers off course or who whose trajectory calculation is refined and deemed no longer dangerous are reallocated to different targets. First, notice that often the interceptors are launched in couples. This is common practice for air defenses to maximize the probability of intercept. This will be important in a minute. Also, I would like to clarify that the system seems to launch isolated interceptors and couples as well, not just couples which actually makes sense and it likely depends on the calculated probability of intercept of the specific target 
An easy target will be engaged by a single interceptor, a difficult target may require two. The confusion about the electro-optic guidance comes from Raytheon corporate website. Raytheon, as I stated in the previous video, produces missile components and it was a co-developer of the system. Raytheon actually markets a system derived from the Iron Dome, the Sky Hunter, which can guide both the Tamir and the Stunner missile. And the Stunner has an electro-optic guidance. And yes, this was the source of the confusion. So, problem solved. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Otis? I have downloaded a video from Raphael's YouTube channel, sir. Okay, so? I think there is a sequence you may want to watch. Rats. In the previous video, I said this. The minimum range of 4 kilometers is not realistic either because it is very long. Light missiles usually require a few hundred meters to arm after launch, uh, just enough to clear the launch premises. Moreover, in the available footage, it seems to hit targets at a relatively low altitude near the vertical above the launcher, which seems closer than 4 kilometers, honestly. The 7 kilometer as maximum range is also a ludicrous number. It is probably the maximum ballistic range in ideal conditions without maneuvering to intercept anything. Uh, not a situation that may happen in real life. Actually, I interpreted these measures incorrectly and in fact, they did not seem realistic. So, normally, when you are given the minimum and maximum range of an anti-aircraft system, they refer to two situations, albeit there are no specific rules. The minimum range is the distance traveled from the launcher before the fuse goes active. It is the minimum distance where the missile could, in theory, go off against a target. The maximum distance is the maximum distance of a cooperative target flying at ideal speed and altitude for the anti-aircraft system. In practice, it is the maximum distance where an aircraft flying straight and level and toward the launcher could be hit. In the case of the Iron Dome, the number 4 km and 70 km means something different. Target launched from close to the system will fly for a short time and the engagement cycle takes time. The Iron Dome can launch a missile in less than 10 seconds from cold, but this may not be enough if the trajectory is quick and low. The system declared performance is a minimum distance of 4 km. The maximum range, declared to be 70 km, is determined by the radar and it is the maximum range at which a rocket launch can be detected. And usually you want to detect the launch position to be exactly sure where the rocket is coming from to avoid firing against something friendly. Now. Like any range that is provided for military systems, radar ranges, weapon ranges, missile ranges, even these are just a broad approximation that gives an idea of the performance. L let's consider the minimum distance, for example. Modern artillery systems have the capability of firing a quick burst along different parabolic trajectories such that all the rounds hit the target at the same time. The first round will climb higher in the sky and it will take longer to reach the impact point than the others fired at progressively lower trajectories. It is pretty intuitive how the first round is definitely easier to intercept than the last one, but they have been shot by the same position. So the distance of the origin point, but the possibility of intersecting the threat actually depends from the trajectory, the speed, and some other parameters. And by the way, this system, as far as I know, are not in use in the Israeli theater, but the example gives you an idea of how any range measure is actually a gross simplification. So, thank you very much for watching this short video. I thought a clarification was necessary. I hope you appreciate that. We will soon get back to the long format. In the meanwhile, if you have enjoyed this video, please do the usual YouTube stuff, like, dislike, subscribe, and so on. I would be incredibly grateful if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donations. And as usual, a big thank you to all those who are already supporting the channel. You have no idea how important you are. 
Well, thank you very much for watching and see you very, very soon.